Good morning. Happy uh, International World Carnivorous Plant Day. Uh, I'm Bruce Lee from Lee's Botanical Gardens here in uh, LaBelle, Florida. Uh, I originally grew up in New Jersey, and uh, we're going to take a, a step back through time. I'm a, I'm a collector from the, the 60s. Uh, when I was nine years old, I got hooked on carnivorous plants mail order. And of course, I killed them off every winter and didn't have really much luck until I moved to Florida which was in 1970, and in 1970, I got a job, I got a motorcycle, and was all over the state looking for reptiles, which is my top priority, and uh, I would stumble across all these pitcher plants and in in all the swamps and bogs that I was hunting. Um, again, reptiles was my concern, and it was neat to see the carnivorous plants, but I never thought they'd blossom into anything, and, and they ended up doing that when I met a an elderly gentleman in South Dade who was selling Venus fly traps and I was out snake hunting one day and I stopped by his place and uh, met Clyde Bramblett and I walked into his greenhouse and my mouth fell to the ground he actually had Nepenthes he probably had eight different species I was in shock needless to say he wanted Saracenia and I wanted Nepenthes so we were trading Nepenthes for Saracenia and a really good relationship bloomed out of that and we were buddies for 20 years. Unfortunately Clyde passed a few years back and uh, his nursery was taken over by his children, excuse me, grandchildren. So I'm 15 years old and I'm living in Florida hunting snakes and discovering plants. Most people in Florida grow orchids, not carnivorous plants, so they weren't all that popular. But you know, in my, my searches, I found all kinds of stuff. In South Florida, there's not a lot of carnivorous plants. From Lake, Oca Lake Okeechobee, which is Okeechobee County on the top side, you do have Saracenia minor growing there. And there's also uh, the butterworts, both Pumilla and Lutea growing there, along with Capillaris. That's as far south as the pitcher plants come. However, back in 1958, there was a locale in Corkscrew Swamp which is just northeast of Naples, Florida. However, I've been down there numerous times. They're not there. And the, the botanists say they're not there, and the wardens say they're not there. So that population has long since expired. In the Everglades, however, you do find Capillaris and Pumilla, large amounts of Pumilla in South Florida. Matter of fact, the, it seems like the farther south you go, the more there is. In the Everglades, when you're driving down 41, you have a sea of sawgrass, which is the Everglades, and then you've got these little islands made out of palm and palmetto. This is where all the pumillas are, and there's literally thousands of them out there if you go January, February, March. Most of them bloom from almost white to dark purple, and you got the whole gauntlet between. However, one out of every 200 of them has got a yellow flower, and that is the Bushwellii form. Now, there was also a recording of a yellow-flowered butterwort that was found on Key Largo. And it took me years to figure out that they were talking about Bushwellii because I was thinking there's no way that Lutea is going to grow in the, in the, the calcium-rich, alkaline-based oolite that's down there. I have seen Pumilla growing on Big Pine Key, so it does make it down that far. In South Florida, the most common carnivorous plant is, of course, the Utricularias, and there's, there's loads of them. The most common one is the big yellow-flowered foxtail, which we call Floribunda. But I don't think that's its real name. It's, it goes by something else. We also have lots of purpurea. Purpurea is really common in Miami. We have gibba. We've got subulata. We've got cornuda. And occasionally we even have recipinata. There's a few others that are real rare that you very, hardly ever see. When I was growing up in the 60s in New Jersey, it was almost impossible to find carnivorous plants. The few dealers that were around, and we're talking, I started in 64, was uh, Peter Paul's Nursery in Canandaigua, New York, Armstrong Associates in Basking Ridge, uh, Northrop's Carnivorous Plant in Hempstead, North Carolina, and then there was a couple of other ones like um, Carolina Biological Supply, that was the only company that was selling butterworts at the time, and, then, and there, they had a, a second business that was out in Oregon that was shipping Darlingtonia. Um, my first Nepenthes was in 1967 off of Peter Paul's nursery. I paid $10 for it. 
going back in time, you're thinking, well, ten dollars was was probably pretty good. Two years later, I got my first job, and I was working for a dollar twenty-five an hour. So you tell me how much ten dollars was. And the second one I bought was fifteen dollars from Oakhurst Gardens, down in uh, Southern Gardens in Oakhurst, California. That was fifteen dollars for a little gracilis this big that didn't make it through the winter. Fifteen dollars was wow. Started Lee's Botanical up in Ocala, and I was there for six years, and then I moved back down to Miami, and uh, hooked up with Clyde Bramblett, and we shared a greenhouse for another six years. And then I moved to LaBelle, and I've been here for 31 years. When I moved up from Miami to LaBelle, I brought all my carnivorous plants, I built the greenhouse, and I built the pit, and this had a chain link fence around it, and I had my 38 crocodilians with me. The big shed that was next to me was nothing but a shed that bred snakes. We had 150 breeder snakes, and that's what I did for a living. I sold carnivorous plants and reptiles. Again, back in the day, things were pretty hard to come by. There was only a handful of Saracenias that were available, and uh, it was funny because they so usually sold them three for two dollars, and the expensive ones were a dollar a piece. Although Northrop did have Cat's B.I. for $2.25 and nobody else had it, so $2.25 is what it was. Also, Darlingtonia hadn't really changed that much because they were $2.50 back in the 60s. And just a few years ago, you still could pick one up at, at, at a floral. They used to sell them in the floral shops in a little package of uh, sphagnum for, for $3.95. They're pretty hard to come by now. Not from very many people can grow them. They're almost impossible to grow in Florida. You can keep them alive through the winter, but they die out in the summer. They can't take the heat. A lot of plants, a lot of the nepenthes are the same way. They'll grow really well out in California, especially in the mountainous area. In Oregon and Washington, that's why all the highland stuff is grown out there. We can't grow it here. And I grow mostly lowland stuff, and yet back in February we had three nights of, of freezing weather, 33, 35, and 38. I know, you're laughing, that ain't cold. But it did all kinds of damage to the Nepenthe, all the lowland stuff, any rafts, any amps, gracilis, viking, mirabilis, they all burned up. As a matter of fact, I lost probably 10% of my seedlings. Leafless orchid, Hyracella, and then you can see the uh, bloom spikes on it with the seed pods hanging down. People always ask me, are the Saracenias really going under? Well, you know, I have been out kicking around for, you know, four decades. And a lot of spots that were around four decades ago, yeah, they're long gone. They've either been drained and built upon, or the environment's changed and they've grown out. There used to be a beautiful leucophila bog just north of the little town of Chipola. Uh, up in the Apalachicola area, and there was so many lucos there. I mean, it was wall. I mean, you couldn't step without stepping on a luco. It was so thick. It was a seepage area in a farmer's field. And now, when I go back to look at it, it's all overgrown with pine and it's thick. And if you walk around in there for about an hour, you'll find a couple of lucos that are just barely hanging on. But in the meanwhile, other places have popped up that we didn't know about in the past. For example, just last year, me and three other plant enthusiasts came across a field of uh, Alabamaensis wearii growing in the state of Florida. And this is 75 miles southeast of where everybody knew they were. So this is like a range extension. And it's not just a few plants, it's literally hundreds of plants in more than one disconnected field. So it's, it's a whole area. Uh, the weird thing about these plants is that most of them are under eight inches tall and they're spitting image of, of weary. I know if ands, or buts, but when they get a little bit taller, and there's very few of them that are over 10 inches tall, they start looking like gull fences. So now we're wondering if maybe this is a pocket of plants that was a, a an intergrade hybrid of uh, weary eye and gulf fences. We're not sure. We, we've got to do some more research on that. It's, it's a very interesting area.
Here's a little tidbit about Nepenthes that I, I read, you know, back before there was cell phones and internet and all that stuff. If you wanted to do research, you actually had to go to a library, sit down for hours and page through books, which is what I used to do because if you live in New Jersey, you got four months out of the year where it's freezing and you can't do anything constructive outside, that's for sure. But I had read in a, a Gardner, Gardner's Chronicle in 1885, this is when they first started selling Nepenthes to the public. And only the richest of the rich could afford Nepenthes, number one, because you had to have a greenhouse, a stove house, to keep them alive through the winter. And no people couldn't afford heating fuel. They could barely afford to heat their house, more or less a greenhouse for plants. Back in the day, 1885, a nice potted orchid cost a dollar fifty. Now you got to realize the average Joe on the street was earning a dollar fifty a day, so that was a day's pay. And the pentes cost fifteen dollars. That's two weeks' pay. You know how many people can afford that? People ask me all the time, "What kept you in the hobby so long?" I started collecting when I was nine years old. I'm sixty. I'm over sixty-seven years old now. It is so addicting. You get one, and you got to have another, and then you get another, and you, you just you, you can't stop. And you want them all. That's basically what it is. You want them all. And through thick and thin over the years, I mean, everybody goes through bad times and good times, and yeah, there's been a lot of bad times, and there's been a lot of good times, but I've always stayed with the carnivorous plant and the reptiles. That's pretty much what my whole life has been about. I do other stupid things like collecting antiques and stuff like that, but it's really the reptiles and the plants that uh, keep me keep me sane. The International Carnivorous Plant Society wants you to be successful with your plants. We welcome growers just getting started all the way through professional scientists. We started an annual World Carnivorous Plant Day to celebrate these spectacular plants. Take a look around our website and you'll find historic documents about carnivorous plants, growing guides, free educational resources, and more. Have questions? Ask. We don't bite. But our plants do.